And good evening to everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study. Welcome to everyone who is joining us on live stream today. And tonight we'll be covering Numbers chapter 15 and 16. But before we get into that, I'd like to take a quick poll, if you will. I'm hoping you guys will help me out. I'd like to take a poll of those who are gathered here. And for those of you who are following along online, you're welcome to play along, but we're going to have to go on the honor system for you. So if you could, it's just a short poll, just two questions, okay? So before I ask the first question, I'd like to start. I'd like everybody to go ahead and raise their hand up, nice and tall. Go ahead. Okay, good. First question. Have you ever complained about a decision made by another person? Okay, yeah, 100%. Okay, and I'm, I'm guessing those of you at home are seeing the same results in, in your venue as well. Okay, one more question. Have you ever watched someone doing something and thought, I could do that better? Yep, okay, still 100%. Awesome, thank you very much. That concludes our poll. Thank you for participating. And I know what you're thinking is, well, wait a minute, you didn't even give me the option, the choice to be able to raise my hand or not. And you're right, that, that's my bad. I, I, I'll tell you what, I'll make it up to you. I'll ask one more question, and I'll give you the chance. I'll give you the choice whether you want to raise your hand or not. But if you raise your hand on this third one, I'm going to assume you would have raised your hand anyway on the first two, okay? Here goes. Are you a human being who has ever been around another human being ever in your life? Okay, yeah, that's kind of what I thought. Glad to see that we're all on the same page then. I do that for a reason. The reason is this. When I look at these stories of the Israelites, and I see what they do, how they complain constantly, right? And I think about how in our own lives, kind of grumbling and complaining every now and then, it's just kind of human nature. But I read these stories, and I see these people, these Israelites, as they're going through their wanderings in the wilderness. And I remember reading and hearing these stories as I was younger, and I remember thinking, these people... They're just the worst. Why on earth does God choose these people? All they do is whine and complain. All they do is grumble and then eventually rebel against God. Why on earth would he support them? But as I've gotten older, I've come to realize they're just people. They're just people who are going through a difficult time. And I wonder to myself, would I be any different? You know, if I were in their situation, if I were going through a difficult time, because you think about it, they were probably very frustrated, maybe even a little scared. That's probably a very difficult time for them. And as personal observation, I've noticed that when people have a little time on their hands, that tends to be when you see more of the grumbling and complaining. You got time to sort of think up those things to complain about, right? When you're busy, it doesn't seem to happen so much. So on days maybe where they weren't traveling all day, they may have had some time on their hands to sit around and think of things to complain about. And so I wondered to myself, would I be any different? And you might think to yourself, no, I would, I would not be complaining like that. I would, I would remember the things that God had done for me. I would remember the miracles, and I would remember all of that, and I would appreciate that, and I would not complain to Moses or God or anything. Would you, though? Would you? Would we really be any different? I mean, again, these are just people, and we've already shown and demonstrated that it is kind of human nature to grumble and complain occasionally, maybe have a little disfaction, maybe even if we're not saying it out loud, maybe we're thinking it. So I wonder if we're, we're, we would be that different. Now, I say this because I want you to look at them in that light as we study them. Because you think about where we've been the last couple of weeks. Okay? When Stephen talked about them, he talked about the grumblings and complainings as they 
essentially challenged Moses on, among other things, his wife, who his wife was. And they sort of rebelled against him. And then we see their great failing of faith when they failed to enter the promised land because they didn't believe the spies in George's lesson last week. And we see this pattern of these people of Israel, right? This grumbling and complaining leading to maybe defiance or rebellion leading to God's judgment or their failings and God's judgment and then punishment after that. And we see this pattern repeated. And unfortunately, we're going to see it again tonight. So the last few chapters, we've seen this narrative play out. And so I want us to think about these as, again, normal people that are just going through a difficult time and ask that self, kind of ask yourself that question in the back of your mind, would I be so different? Now, after we've read all this narrative, we've read these great stories and we've heard these awful things about, you know, how they failed, how they, how they lost their faith. And then, you know, they rebelled against God by saying, no, no, we know better. We're, we've got the numbers. We're going to go in and we're going to take the promised land for ourselves. And of course, God wasn't with them and they got chased off. Didn't work out so well for them. Right? So we see this failing in them. And after all of these narrations, we come to chapter 15, and what do we get? Sacrifices and laws and more ordinances from God. And if you were reading this narration, you were reading the book of Numbers straight through, you may look at that at first glance and go, well, that seems out of place. Why, why do we have this, this book about like sacrifices and laws or this chapter in here wedged right in between two narrations about the things that are going on in the people of Israel. Now, one of the things we must consider when we are looking at divinely inspired Scripture is we must assume purpose. We must assume that there is a reason for this to be here, wedged in between these two narrations. It very well could be that chronologically, this is what happened next. It could very well be that after they failed to enter the promised land and they were turned away and they started their wanderings, that God through Moses gave them more directions about some of the sacrifices they were going to be making. It very well could be that. It also could be an example of what we see oftentimes in the Bible of God introducing a concept to us and then showing us an example of that concept so that we can better understand that. We see that throughout Numbers. We see that through some of Jesus' teachings as well in the New Testament. Either way, I think as we go through chapter 15 here, and we're going to kind of skim through it. We're not going to read the whole of chapter 15. We're going to kind of skim through and hit some of the high points and the big topics here. But I think once we look at chapter 15, I think you're going to have a better understanding, especially in context with what happens in chapter 16, why this is here and why this is important. So we begin chapter 15. In verses 1 and 2, we read this. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, and say to them, When you enter the land where you are to live, which I am giving you, then make an offering by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering or a sacrifice to fulfill a special vow. And then the passage goes on a little further to describe this particular offering, the sacrifice, and how they were to make it. Now, I want to key in on that phrase there. When you enter the land which I am to give you. This phrase is actually repeated in verse 18 as well. Now, if you're one of those people who just failed to enter the promised land because you lost faith and you were turned away, that's got to sting a little, right? That is kind of a reminder of what you've lost. It's almost as if to say... It's almost that God said, when you go into the land, not you, when you go into the land that I'm about to give you, not you also, here are some of the sacrifices that we're going to do, right? For those people, for those people who have missed out on that promise, wow, that hurts. That is a constant reminder of what is lost. However, we don't really know how much time has passed here. And so, we could be into our wanderings where we are actually changing over to that next generation. We could have some people coming of age that are part of that next generation that are going to be inheriting that promise. And so to those people, when they hear this, 
wow, that's, that's a great comfort. That's a great comfort to realize that even though we as a people failed miserably, God is still going to keep his promise, right? And as long as I'm obedient, as long as I'm obedient and I'm doing, doing what God wants me to do, I stand to inherit that promise. That's a tremendous lesson for us today as well, which we'll get to later on in the end. So you have this discussion about this promise, which again, for a portion of the people is going to be a great encouragement. But then after that, there is a discussion about these other peoples that are following along with the nation of Israel. Now you imagine this, this large, massive caravan of the nation of Israel out in the wilderness. You have some of these other peoples who have kind of joined along. They may not necessarily be of Israelite heritage, but they have accepted the Lord as their God. They are attempting to obey and live as God would have them to live. And so there is this discussion here about how there are sacrifices that can be made that can benefit them as well, how they can be covered by these offerings as well. To those people, this is also a great comfort, right? This is a great encouragement from God that, hey, we stand to inherit this promise too. If we are obedient to God, God's going to take care of us as well. So you have, for a good portion of the people, you have two straight encouragements here after this great failing that they had in chapter 14. Now, the next discussion, starting in about verse 22, talks about that unintentional sin. And there's this discussion about how we're going to handle an unintentional sin, where somebody sins and it's, it's by accident. And so I think of an example where, you know, a person may have committed a sin, they didn't realize they committed a sin, maybe it was brought to their attention later on, maybe it was something that they learned and realized later on, oh no, what have I done? How do I make this right with God? And God here is again offering a path. He is offering a way, saying there are sacrifices that we can make for this as well. So he's, he's offering to take care of them as well. Again, another message of comfort, another message of assurance. Ah, but then, verse 30, we change gears a little bit. It's almost as if God is saying, you know, I want you to inherit this promise. I have conditions and ways to take care of those of you who are not necessarily of Israelite birth and those of you who sin unintentionally. But, starting in verse 30, if you are going to be defiant to me, now that's another matter entirely. In verse, starting in verse 30, he starts talking about what some translations refer to as high-handed sin. And it made me wonder when I was studying this, wonder if this, maybe this is where we get the common phrase of underhanded, where underhanded sometimes means hidden or unknown, but yet high-handed, the high-handed sin described here is bold, kind of in your face, defiant, rebellious sin. And what God is saying here is, when it comes to that type of sin, I have no patience for that. I absolutely hate that. And we're going to deal with that. And then there's an example given, and yet another example of how the Bible gives us a concept. And then an example, there's an example given in this chapter about the Sabbath breaker. And in this particular example, this story of the Sabbath breaker, we're not talking about somebody that, again, inadvertently, you know, accidentally did something on the Sabbath they shouldn't have done and violated the law. No, no, we've, we've already covered that. We've covered unintentional sin earlier in the chapter. Now we're talking about defiant sin. We're talking about somebody who says, I know what the law is according to the Sabbath. I don't care. I'm going to do what I want. And so in this case, we see God's judgment. We see that God's judgment is swift and the punishment is final. And that this person was stoned to death for their sin. A very different example than what we've seen with the unintentional sin just earlier in the scripture. Now this chapter rounds out with a discussion about tassels. God's encouragement, his instruction for people to put these tassels on their clothing. And he wanted them to do this as a reminder. He wanted them to do this to help them remind them to be obedient because he wanted them to inherit this promise. So when you look at chapter 15 and you lay it all out, you, you see God has a promise and that promise still exists. 
And God is telling his people, I want you to be successful. I want you to inherit this promise. It is still valid. And for those of you who are following along and may not have be of Israelite birth, but you have accepted me as your God and you are obedient, we're going to take care of you as well. We have sacrifices and offerings to help you as well. And if you sin unintentionally, you make a mistake, we've got offerings and sacrifices for that. But if you rebel against me, we're done. I'm done with you. And so what I want you to do is I want you to put these tassels on your clothing to help remind you to be obedient because I so desperately want you to be faithful. I want you to be successful and earn this promise that I have for you. Okay? If you look at chapter 15 in that context, especially considering what we're about to see in chapter 16, it makes a lot of sense then why God would include this discussion in this text right here. Because as we go into chapter 16, what do we find? More failure and rebellion. In chapter 16, we cover what we commonly refer to as Korah's rebellion. Okay? Now, Korah was not alone. Korah may have been one of the ringleaders, but we often refer to this as Korah's rebellion, probably because it just rolls off the tongue. And so we think of this in terms of Korah's rebellion, but it was actually three guys that were named specifically, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but I'm just going to roll with it. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And these guys were kind of the ringleaders. These guys were kind of, they started the grumbling and the complaining. And they got together with a number of the Levites and the community leaders, these people that do have a little bit of authority, a little bit of privilege. And they started the grumbling and they started complaining. And the thing about grumbling and complaining is that it's viral. It is contagious. And it is very easy to get swept up in it. And so they've got a group of people, and I can almost just, I can almost picture these conversations, right? Because they're grumbling and complaining about Moses and Aaron. You know, who do they think they are? Right? They're no better than the rest of us. God is with all of us. Why do they think they're better than us? Why do we have to listen to them? We could do that job just as good as they could. I can almost picture those arguments. You know what? Somebody ought to say something to them. You're right. We should go say something to them. And, you know, before long, you get a group of people that, sure enough, they go and they challenge Moses and Aaron. And they come, and we see this in the beginning of chapter 16. They go and they challenge them, and they say, You have gone too far, Moses and Aaron. You exalt yourselves above us. God is with all of us, right? We're all God's people. Any one of us could, could lead like you are. Why? You know, who do you think you are? And so we see this, and then we see... Moses' reaction to this. And this is fascinating to me, Moses' reaction. We see this in verse 4. And in verse 4, we read, When Moses heard this, he fell on his face, and he spoke to Korah and all his company, saying, Tomorrow morning the Lord will show who is his, who is holy, and will bring him near to himself, even the one whom he will choose. He will bring near to himself. We read that Moses fell on his face before these people. Now, that caught my attention because I know that I've read that a number of other places, especially in the Old Testament, where we would see various men of God, prophets and such, when they would come into the presence of God. They would you know, fall on their face in complete reverence, fear and trembling, right? And I thought to myself, no, surely that is not what Moses is doing here. In fact, we read the same thing back in chapter 14, verse 5. Moses falling on his face again. And so I got to looking up the Hebrew word for this, and I'm not going to attempt to pronounce it. But one of the things I looked up was, is that sure enough, this is actually the same word that is used for times when men of God, when they would come into God's presence, would fall on their face in reverence. But that word actually has many uses. One of those is for that giving reverence or extreme honor. There's actually other uses that include exasperation or frustration. And I think that's closer to what Moses is feeling here, right? Because think about, again, where we've been. Think about the human nature of people grumbling and complaining all the time and how much Moses has had to put up with it. 
And here again is yet another challenge to his authority. Now, I've tried to come to what I think is the most um, complete, I guess, modern day example of what Moses is doing here. Okay, and so this is what I've come to. You ready for it? You know, what are you doing? What are you thinking? Right? That may be this expression. He may be falling on his face, but this is what he's doing. Think about it. These people are challenging him again, and Moses is like, ah, this is not going to end well. What are you thinking? Right? Because Moses, more than anybody, knows exactly who they are actually challenging. They may have forgotten. They may have gotten lost in all their grumbling and complaining, who they're actually challenging, who they're actually complaining against. But Moses is well aware, and he knows how this is going to end. And so he chastises them right here and says, Wait a minute, you have been given roles of respect. You have been given privilege. You have the honor to serve God in ways that other members of the nation are not allowed to do. You uh, civil leaders have been given a, a, an air of responsibility and authority to help serve the people. And this is not enough for you. You want more. You want my job as well. So we see Moses absolutely just exasperated with them. And I don't know how much time passes, but we read a little bit further. We read that Moses attempts to try to reconcile with them. He attempts to try to talk to Dathan and Abiram. And my thought is that maybe, maybe Korah was too wound up, and he realized that maybe, maybe I could talk some sense into these other guys. And it, it's kind of a testament to the kind of leader that Moses was, right? He wanted to keep the peace. He wanted to resolve this. And he wanted to talk to these men if he could, but they refused to talk to him. In fact, by verse 13, we see them not only refusing to talk to him, but further trying to stir people up. And it's kind of the same old thing that they've been throwing out for a while now. Oh, you know, it's Moses' fault we're stuck out here. We, we had it good in Egypt, remember? We had it good. If, if he hadn't brought us out here, we wouldn't be in this mess. It's all his fault. Right? So they're continuing to stir people up against Moses and Aaron. So then we get some more direction from God. And verses 16 and 17, the instruction is given about their censers or their little uh, fire pans that they had. That they were then to take these fire pans, they were to fill them, and then God would decide who he would accept. Now, in the meantime, these people, these, these three men, uh, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, as well as these Levites and community leaders, these 250, have gathered even more people to their cause, right? They're getting everybody together at the tent of meeting against Moses and Aaron. And I got to feel like this was the thought process, well, if we can just get enough public support, maybe we can get some changes made. Maybe we can get a change in leadership and we can, we can do things the way we want. I can almost picture, you know, that that is the mindset there. And so they gather all these people together up against Moses and Aaron, and it's at this point that the Lord appears. And the Lord is not happy. Because, as we've discussed before, God hates rebellion. He hates that defiant sin. We talked about it in chapter 15. And He's ready to wipe them out. He's ready to wipe out the whole congregation right then and there. But it's at this point that we see Moses again pleading for His people. And we've seen Him do this time and again. And in verse 22, we read this. But they fell on their faces, same word, by the way, and said, O oh God, God of the spirits of all flesh, when one man sins, will you be angry with the entire congregation? It's as if Moses is saying, God, I know there's some people here who have sinned, and there's some people that are doing wrong, but there's a whole lot of other people that have been caught up in this that may not even realize what is going on here. Do we really need to punish the entire congregation, the whole people for this? or just the people who have committed the sin. And so God relents. God says, okay, I'm going to give you a new instruction then. I want you to have the people pull their tents away, separate themselves from Korah, Datham, and Abiram. Pull their tents away from their families and separate them. And which is interesting because it's kind of symbolic. It's a separating 
of the congregation from defiant sin. Right? Because, again, these are not people who have sinned by mistake. Remember, we talked about unintentional sin. These are not those kind of people. These are people who have defiantly rebelled against God, and they refuse to change. And so the congregation of Israel is separating themselves from that sin. Now, what's fascinating to me about this, and we read this, is that Korah and Dathan and Abiram and their families and their households watched this happen. They watched this happen. They watched these people moving everything away from them. And we see this in verse 27. Now, I like to think that if that were me, if I were the one standing at, at the opening of the tent and watching the rest of the, the, the people kind of separate themselves from me, I like to think that my thought would be, oh, that's not good. I've messed up. I need to fix this because that's, that's not going to end well. But I also think that in this particular case, their attitude may have been one more of defiance because that is all we see from them is this defiance rebellion. And it may very well have been, you know what? If you don't want us, we don't need you either. But it's fascinating to me to think about what thoughts might have been going through their head as they watched this happen. So then, after this has happened, we get God's judgment. And we start reading in verse 28. And if you want to follow along, we're going to read 28 through 30. In verse 28, Moses said, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these deeds, for this is not my doing. If these men die the death of all men, or if they suffer the fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord brings about an entirely new thing, and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that is theirs, and they descend alive into Sheol, then you will understand that these men have spurned the Lord. So Moses is telling his people this. Look, if these guys die of natural causes or any of the many things that could cause us to lose our life out here in the wilderness, then you understand that God hasn't sent me and you don't have to follow me. However, if God creates something completely new, something you've never seen before, and the earth literally opens up and swallows them whole, oddly specific, but yes, if the earth opens up and swallows them whole and they go down alive, right, then you know that this is from God. They have rebelled against God. And of course, we know that that's exactly what happened, which I have to imagine must have been a terrifying display of power for the people who witnessed this. Can you imagine? You've never seen anything like that before. Wait, this is a thing? The earth can open up and swallow us whole if we defy God? Yeah, that, that would be terrifying. I can only imagine what they were thinking. But that's not all. Shortly after that, we read that those other 250, remember those Levites, those community leaders, and their little fire sensors? Well, those ignited, and these guys caught fire and were burned alive. Yeah. You think about, you know, if somebody catches fire to their tent and gets burned up and it's one person, you think, okay, maybe that's an accident. 250 of them all at once, that's probably something different, right? That's probably God. So we see very quickly in, in a few short verses, very swiftly, God's judgment is swift and his punishment is final for people who are defiant to him. And so we see this here. And then God says, all right, now that we've done that, I want you to take those sensors and I want you to beat them into plates. And then I want you to fix those plates to the altar. Because I want this to be a reminder. You see, we had another reminder. We had some tassels on our clothing that were, help, that were supposed to be, help us remember to be obedient. Remember those? That didn't work in this case. So we're going to have another reminder now. And I bet we're not going to look at that altar the same way anymore, right? Because we're going to see those plates and remember, oh yeah, those are the censors, those are the guys that defied God. They rebelled against him. And that didn't work out so well. So that's another, yet another reminder because again, God wants his people to be obedient. He wants them to be successful to inherit that promise. So here's another reminder to help them remember, don't do this. 
Now, one would think that would be sufficient. And yet, at the very end of this chapter, what do we read? More grumbling and complaining. From members of the congregation. And there's claims that Moses had caused the death of these people. And again, I can, I can picture the conversations. Maybe people that didn't witness the event. Maybe they were too far away. They didn't see the earth swallow up these people. Well, you know, I heard these people stood up to Moses and he had them all killed. I don't think that's right. Somebody should say something to him. And again, the cycle completes, right? People start infecting others with this viral complaining. And God immediately is like, you know what? I've had enough. I'm going to wipe them out. And so he sends a plague. And we're not told what kind of plague it is. But it's killing the people. And we're, I like to think, or I like to try to visualize this plague as something that is kind of rolling like a wave over the, the community. Because it's coming in, because we have this picture at the end where Moses and Aaron are interceding for the people. And we have this image of, of Aaron with his incense literally standing between the living and the dead. Symbolic gesture, of course, but literally as the plague is coming, he is standing in between the plague and the people, interceding on their behalf. And so God calls off the plague. But not before 14,700 people are killed. 14,700. Add that to the 250 uh, community leaders and Levites. Add that to uh, Korah, Datham, and Abiram and their families and households. And we're probably looking at right about 15,000 people, all dead because of grumbling and complaining that escalated and became action or rebellion against God. Now, we read through 15 and 16 and we see all this happening. But what do we take from it? How does this apply to us? Okay. Well, I, there's a few things that I'd like to bring out, a few points, and one I already mentioned, and it's that the promise of God is not necessarily nullified by our failings, and that is a great comfort to us. It was a great comfort to these people, this next generation, that they could still inherit the promised land, that God keeps His promise. Now, there may be people who have chosen not to be obedient and are not going to get to enjoy that promise, but God is still going to keep his promise for those who are. Similarly, God has promises for us, right? He has promises about Jesus' return. He has a promise about eternal life in heaven. And we stand to inherit those if we are obedient to God. Sure, some people are going to make decisions and choices to rebel against God, and they're not going to get to enjoy those promises. But God is still going to keep that promise. Another point I bring out here, and it's the same thing that we saw a couple weeks ago with Stephen's lesson, is that God hates rebellion. We see multiple times through this chapter where God is ready to wipe out the people because they are rebelling against Him. That high-handed sin, that open, defiant sin against God, He has no patience for it, and He hates it. And so another thing we see here is that Grumbling, complaining, it's viral. I've seen this in the workplace. I've seen how a person can come in with a bad attitude, a little disgruntled, and they can actually then spread that to other people. How they can get them complaining and agitated about something that may not even apply to them. May not even have a dog in the fight on this. But yet they get them all fired up and riled up, and now you have a group of people that are all disgruntled and complaining Maybe it's about a particular leader or a particular decision that was made in the workplace. And I've seen it be viral. And what we see here in this passage is how easy it is to get swept up in it. It's easy for us as well, right? It's, we've all admitted that it is human nature for people to grumble and complain sometimes. To think maybe, well, maybe I could do better at this than someone else. That's human nature. So, it is very easy to get swept up into it, and we have to be very careful as Christians that we are not contributing to that behavior. Because the next thing that I pull out of this is that God demands our obedience, and He wants us to stay faithful. 
We see in this passage that he had the tassels and the plates as reminders. He used those to help remind the people to be obedient. He had encouragements in chapter 15 that I want you to be successful. I want you to inherit this promise. He had instructions for the offerings and the atonements that they can make. You know, we have reminders as well. We take the Lord's Supper every Sunday, right? That is a reminder, a reminder of God's love for us, a reminder of what Jesus did for us, right? That is a constant reminder so that then we will love and appreciate God for what has been done for us. We also have instructions and examples, things that we can turn to, to be able to understand how God wants us to live. And the last thing I pull out of this is about respecting roles. Respecting the roles laid out by God is vital. These Levites, these community leaders in this passage, they had special privilege. They had special roles. They probably had some authority. And it wasn't enough for them. They didn't want to keep their place. They wanted more. They were envious of somebody else's role, somebody else's position. Now, if that sounds familiar, it's because there's a similar story in the book of Jude. It's told about Satan and his angels. They had a, a position of privilege as well. They had uh, some authority. They had some honor and prestige, and it wasn't enough. They didn't want to keep their place, and they too rebelled against God, and we know how that worked out for them as well. We have a special privilege as God's children. Do we appreciate it? We each have a role in the kingdom that Christ established. Are we trying to do our best in our role? Or are we spending too much time looking at someone else's role and how they're handling theirs? Maybe thinking, maybe complaining about how they're handling theirs or thinking, oh, I could do that better. Are we supportive and respectful of leadership roles? Now, leaders have a tough job. They have to make decisions. We don't always agree with those decisions. But we have a responsibility to be respectful and supportive of their, their role and those decisions that they have to make. And I'll leave you with this. If we find ourselves continually complaining and challenging godly leadership, our rebellion is not against that particular leader. It's against God himself. Given what we've studied tonight, given the story and what we've learned from Korah's rebellion, we do not want to find ourselves on the wrong side of that sort of judgment. We each have a privilege as children of God. We each have a role in the kingdom. And we each have a responsibility to do our best in that role and to be supportive of others as they too try to serve God the best they can in their roles. The decision is ours. What kind of people will we be? Will we be the people that God wants us to be? Or will we be the people that God talks about in these particular passages? Thank you.